Hey everyone, thanks for uh, joining me. I'm really excited for this webinar. We are going to uh, get started in just about a minute. I'm gonna give everyone about a minute. I sent an email out reminding everyone 7 p.m. Central. Uh, so we'll give everyone about a minute to kind of hop in here and get going. Uh, I have a couple questions for you though. Uh, before we get going so one let me know where you're watching from just in the chat and then also let me know what's your biggest issue with your inner mix currently so i asked a few of you to uh to email me beforehand what's the biggest issue you have heard a lot of really good feedback from people so let me know one where you're watching from two what's your biggest issue les says aloha from hawaii uh, man, Les, I wish I was in Hawaii right now. I'm a little jealous. So let us know in the chat. Again, we'll get started in about a minute. I'll let the slides continue to cycle through. Thank you guys for being here. I'm really excited for this webinar. Uh, so again, we'll get started in about a minute. So see you guys in just a second. All right, hey everyone, uh, thanks so much for joining us. I see a few people chiming in over on the chat. Uh, Les says, hey from Hawaii, aloha from Hawaii. Victoria says, hey from Northern Maine. Uh, 200 records a day says, hello from Philly. Uh, John from Winnipeg, uh, Jared from Minnesota. Matthew says, sup, I'm not sure where sup is, but uh, sounds like an interesting place. Uh, <clears throat> Renee's here from Clayton, Delaware, awesome. So people from all over the place watching. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm a little jealous of, uh, of Les from Hawaii, uh, someone from uh, Jansville, Wisconsin. Awesome. So I say we get started. Thank you guys so much for being here again. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. A couple of housekeeping things I want to mention up front uh, before we get into the content. Very first thing, because I know the question will come up if it hasn't already. Uh, is if you need to leave early, yes, there will be a replay link for this. Now, the one thing I want to make sure uh, that you know is in order to get the replay link right uh, after the webinar, so tomorrow morning, I think at like 5 or 6 a.m., I'm going to send a follow-up email with the replay link. If you need to leave, you want the replay link, just make sure you've actually registered for the webinar. So the way that you can register if you're watching this on YouTube is go to fromstudiostage.com slash live, okay? So let's pull this guy up here. There we go. Fromstudiostage.com slash live. This is a bit of a uh, kind of, um, uh, oh, wait one second. Let's mute this so it doesn't start going. All right, this is a bit of inception, right? We're watching the webinar on the page, on the page. Uh, but make sure you go here and click register for free so that you can see um, that replay link once I send it out. Again, tomorrow morning, I'm going to send that over to you as soon as you're ready. So if you need to leave, just make sure you've registered. That's all you got to do from studiostage.com slash live. You're also going to get my outline later. So I'm going to mention a lot of links. I'm going to try my best to, um, to jump over and paste those if I can. But don't worry, all the links are going to be in the outline. So if you got to leave, you'll get the replay as long as you're registered from cdsage.com slash live. You'll get the outline with all the links. Uh, if you're a person that likes to follow along, um, maybe just watch tonight, enjoy it, think of questions, uh, and then you can check the outline out later. Uh, last thing, if you want to chat or ask questions, you need to do the reverse of what you did before. If you happen to be watching on from cdsage.com slash live, click through the video player over to YouTube. So it looks like we've got a lot of people that found their way over here again, commenting. Matthew says, sorry from Minnesota. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, Josh is here from Ontario, Canada. Uh, Steven, uh, Illinois, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Awesome. I love tons of people from all over the place. So uh, again, uh, one more time, just for the people that just joined us, uh, make sure you've registered from studiostage.com slash live. If you want to chat, click through watch over on YouTube so that you can chat in the chat room. Um, and then uh, you can ask questions there. And again, uh, tomorrow, if you registered, you will get my outline um, and the replay link immediately, which is great. 
Awesome. Uh, Andy, let's uh, let's uh, mention what he said here. He says, my biggest issue with the mix is getting a good balance between myself, the band, and the click. That is like almost every email that I got from people. So if you guys are watching live now, let me know what's the biggest issue that you are having uh, with your in-ear mix right now. So tonight is going to be a lot of fun. Again, uh, thanks to Digital Audio Labs for sponsoring this, making it free so that you guys can access it so you can share it later with the rest of your band, with the rest of your team, if you're a worship leader leading a team. Uh, so I think this is going to be a lot of fun. So let's kind of summarize, though. What is the goal of tonight? What's what's the focus? of tonight. So my goal tonight uh, is really to do one thing, and that's to help you consistently create a great in-ear mix no matter your setup, right? So yes, this is sponsored by Digital Audio Labs. Yes, we will talk about the live mix mixer, but if you've got an Avium, if you've got a wireless in-ear uh, setup, if you're using a headphone amp, the principles we're going to talk about apply to you as well too. You don't have to go out and purchase gear. Now we're going to talk a little bit about gear. Because gear's fun, right? We just wrapped up Nam a couple weeks ago. Uh, so everyone loves talking about gear. And we 100% will talk about gear. But a big chunk of this webinar is the gear you have, the setup you have. How do you create a consistent in your mix? I was at uh, my buddy's church in... Um, I forgot about well, San Diego. I was thinking of San Jose, but in San Diego, uh, not too long ago and walked in and had to really quickly create a in-ear mix, got done teaching an Ableton class, had to step on stage to create an in-ear mix really quickly. And I was able to apply the principles I'm going to teach you tonight and got an in-ear mix going and it worked and it allowed me to, to really lock into the rest of the band, which was good. Um, so let's see another Jared said biggest issue, same as Andy and more specifically, whenever my singer sings, she's much louder than she sings. Yeah. When she leads and sings, she's much louder than when she sings backgrounds, getting her balance is really tough. That's a great question. Edward says, what in your do you recommend? Edward check out from cstage.com slash live. We have a webinar called Choosing the Right In-Ears. So that'll answer that question all the way, which is great. So that is our goal tonight is to help you consistently create a great in-ear mix. Again, no matter your setup, no matter what you have, that's what we're going to talk about. Primarily, I want to talk about three things, right? Um, and answer three questions. One, why is creating a great in-ear mix so difficult? Uh, almost everyone that emailed in, again, kind of said similar things. They're just struggling to get a good balance. They're struggling to hear themselves and hear the band. The few people write in that were MDs and they said, hey, as an MD, I need to hear myself really well. I need to be a good musician, but I also have to make sure everyone else is playing the right thing. That's really difficult. That's one of the most difficult roles. So we're going to talk about why is creating a great in-ear mix so difficult. Two, how can you consistently create a great in-ear mix again so we talked about uh you know i talked about going to my buddy's uh church in san diego had to really quickly create a in-ear mix how can i walk into that situation that's different than a wireless in-ear pack and consistently create a great in-ear mix no matter what the situation is and then three how can you improve your current setup so this is the gear portion of this or we're going to talk about gear that you can add into your setup. And actually, even before that, we're going to just talk about a few small tweaks you can make to your setup that you may or may not already be doing that don't cost any money or cost a little bit of money. And then we'll talk about some gear that we can add into that. Uh, Valley View Travel says, how to avoid volume creep. Continually raising volume to hear the parts you need more of until you run out of slider. That is a great Great question, and we will specifically address that as well. So let's start um, uh, again, just one more time as a reminder. What's your biggest issue with your inner mix? I love the comments you guys are, are posting. Hey, Ricky, just saw Ricky join. Thanks for joining us. Uh, let me know in the comments what's your biggest issue with your inner mix. If you're watching after the fact uh, and watching the replay on YouTube, just comment over on YouTube and let us know. Um, I try to do my best to keep up with comments uh, on YouTube, but if you leave a comment, I'd love to reply. Um, and let me know, even if you're watching after the fact, what's your biggest issue with your inner mix? So why do, why is creating a great inner mix such a struggle? Why is it so difficult? Well, I think one of the reasons, uh, and particularly in the church world, now you may be watching this and you're like, I'm not playing in the church world. This applies to you as well too. But particularly in the church world, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, everyone started using AVMs and we started giving uh, musicians that have no formal training have never stepped in a recording studio control over their mix. So we basically go, here's a recording console, make it sound good, right? And they have no formal training. They don't understand uh, mono versus stereo. They don't understand gain. 
They don't understand how to use effects or EQ. Uh, and it's just a mess, right? So I think one of the reasons we have big issues is we put people that have no formal training in mixing uh, in charge of their own in-ears. Now, I don't think that uh, it takes a whole lot. I think, honestly, everything that we talk about in this webinar, you can share with the rest of your band, the rest of your team, uh, and they can apply these principles and create a great mix. It's not that difficult, but it takes some training. And I've seen in a lot of situations, again, especially in the church world, uh, where people that come in that are volunteers that don't have a whole lot of time, uh, they struggle with a great intermix because we have not trained them properly. Uh, I see it in bands too that show up to clubs uh, and the guy who's running monitors for him is normally the lighting guy. Uh, so he just stepped down to the monitor console and he's just moving faders up and has no idea what he really should be doing. And our intermix is difficult. We kind of feel like it's it's a, a, a thing that we just deal with, something that we just live with is a bad intermix. I don't think we have to. Another reason, I'm going to pick on the guitar players just for a second. <clears throat> As a fellow guitar player, I feel like I uh, have the freedom to do that. For guitar players, when we mic our amp up and we step on stage with in-ears, oftentimes this is the first time that we've actually listened to our guitar amp. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Now, as guitar players, I, you've probably heard me tell this before if you've seen a few webinars I've done, but as guitar players, we basically step on stage, we plug into our guitar amp, we play, hit a G chord, we check our clean, our drive, our distortion, uh, and it sounds amazing. But it sounds amazing because we're standing you know, a couple feet above the speaker. Now, depending on your height, if you're like me, you're, you're a little closer to the speaker. If you're a little taller, you might be a, a little further away from the speaker. Well, then we go to wear in-ears and suddenly it's like we actually hear what our amp sounds like for the first time. So I remember that one of the first times I used in-ears uh, as a guitar player and listening to my amp, it was awful. It was absolutely terrible. And I just thought, man, the sound guy is such an idiot. What is he doing? He has no idea how to EQ my amp. He's using the wrong mic. No, he was doing everything perfectly fine. If your guitar amp doesn't sound great with a 57, it ain't the mic. Everybody sounds great on a 57. So he put the mic up against it. And then I finally realized, oh gosh, that's, that's what my amp sounds like. My amp sounds terrible. And it taught me the basics of tone. Uh, taught me how to uh, really listen to my amp and create a sound that blended with uh, the band as opposed to just trying to sound like Eddie Van Halen all the time or whoever I was trying to sound like in the moment. So again, I think guitar players, we really struggle because it's the first time we've actually listened to our amp. Now, what about singers? Why is it so difficult for singers? Well, everyone just imagine stepping on stage, trying to sing. Just do this right now if you're watching the webinar. Put your fingers in your ears. Uh it's difficult, right? You hear it in your head. You kind of hear it in your ears. It just sounds awful, right? It's really, really difficult uh, to to, um, to to follow along, to sing. Uh, Jason says everybody sounds good on a 57, unless they have bad guitar tone. Uh, then they don't sound good on a 57. Um, so as singers, though, it's that's a really difficult thing, right? Even just for me to talk with my fingers in my ears is really difficult. So then we say singers, all right, pop in in ears sing and what ends up happening what this uh what this lady's doing in this image if you could tell she pulled an in-ear out so that she can hear can hear the audience uh that's not good right we're we're gonna definitely mention that do not pull an in-ear out that is probably the worst thing you do it's a dangerous thing in fact to pull your in-ear out uh but it's something people do all the time and i i don't blame them because this right it's very awkward it's very very weird uh, i think one of the other reasons that it's a struggle and this probably speaks more to um, our generation, our time, whatever. This is the old man in me uh, is we expect everything to be instant and uh, we expect it to be easy. Right. So we expect it to, you know, we live in the microwave generation where we pop in uh, uh, some food and it's ready in 30 seconds. Uh, and we think it should be easy. Right. We you know, I plug into this mixer. Why does it not sound good? It should be easy for me. But I always try to remind people the first time you got on a bike. How well did that go for you? Probably not well. If it was like me, I remember my dad pushing me on the bike and then I kept falling and kept falling. And then finally I got it uh, until I went down a hill, kind of lost control and, and uh, had a disaster. Right. Um, it took you a while when you were learning to ride a bike to understand uh, how to ride a bike. Right. So I think um, those are just a couple of reasons why I think we typically have issues uh, with an in-ear mix. Right. 
we have not trained ourselves or the rest of our band, or if you're a worship leader leading a team, you haven't trained your team well. Um, guitar players, we haven't really learned how to create great tone. We're not actually listening to our amp. Uh, singers are, it's just a difficult thing to sing with in ears, you know, just regardless, you can have the best mix in the world and it's still a little difficult. And then again, we expect it to be instant and easy, right? So I want to talk, uh, kind of moving from there. I want to start talking about some of those things that we can apply again to consistently create a great in-ear mix. And it's not difficult. Uh, some of you emailed in asking for specifics of what frequency do I cut on this? What do I do this? What plugin do I put here? What? You know, we're going to talk about basics here because I think uh, it's the basics that win a football game, right? I know nothing about football, uh, but I know it's all about strategy. And I know the teams that just get the basics down and just do that win, right? That's why the Patriots always win. Although that was the worst Super Bowl I've ever seen in my life. It was so, so boring. So um, it's, it's about basics. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about basics, but it's very, very practical. So even if you're a more advanced user, don't turn off the webinar. Don't think you need to leave now. Uh, what we're going to talk about is going to apply no matter what your situation is. So I want to start before we get into what I call the mix essentials. I want to start kind of talking about um, really this this idea of what's the purpose of in-ears, right? What is the purpose of in-ears? So I think a lot of times, and maybe I should add this to the previous section, I think a lot of times we think of in-ears, <laughs> And we don't think of in-ear monitors. We are expecting our in-ears to be in-ear listeners, right? We, we think of grabbing our iPhone, plugging in our AirPods, plugging in our headphones, and listening to music, right? And listening to music is this polished kind of finished thing. Um, it, it's this, this nice experience, right? Well, I want to draw a distinction between listening and monitoring, right? That's what we call it, in-ear monitors, not in-ear listeners, right? And that's a terrible name regardless, but there's a reason we call it in-ear monitors as opposed to in-ear listeners. And that's because the purpose is to monitor, right? The purpose is to stand on stage to make sure we can hear enough of ourself and we can hear enough of the rest of the band so that we could create a great performance. Again, no matter what type of music you're playing, whether you're playing to click, whether you're playing to tracks, a lot of people think in-ears is just for the purpose of playing to click and tracks. You don't even have to play to click and tracks. If you can get a great in-ear mix, um, you're going to have a great performance. I think it's one of the keys to a great performance. So here's what I want to do. Here's where I want to start us. Again, like I said, uh, we're not going to talk about a lot of really difficult things. We're not going to talk about things that re require lots of money. Now, we'll get some of the gear stuff, which may be a little bit of money. Uh, but I want to start by talking about some of the mix essentials. Uh, now, someone actually posted a comment. Let's look at this here. They said, hello, I sing lead with a cover band. I struggle with the balance to be able to hear what I need to. And with my uh, custom in-ears, struggle a bit hearing my low notes. Right. So that's a good, that's a good one. Now, depending on what in-ears you have, kind of depends on what range you can hear, right? So if you guys haven't yet, go back again from studiostages.com slash live. You can click the link down at the bottom that says um, previous webinars. And there's a link to the creating uh, or choosing the right in-ears, I think is what we called it. Uh, that was sponsored by Auclear. Free webinar, you can rewatch it at any time. Uh, but the idea of that webinar was to help you choose the right in-ears. And we talk a bit about why sometimes with your in-ears, they might not have the best bass response or they might not have the best high end. Now, that doesn't help if you just bought brand new in-ears and you feel like the bass response isn't great. But um, check out that webinar if you guys have not yet. So let's get into this. Let's talk about mix essentials, okay? So I want to talk about some things that I think uh, to me are key this again goes to it's key to creating a great intermix no matter what your your setup is no matter what type of music you're playing so made this little diagram for us to work from so when we talk about mix essentials now uh, the left uh, side here is showing us volume right so the higher up means the louder in volume the lower down in the pyramid is lower in volume so to me this is the the, the kind of how mix essentials start the first thing the loudest thing in your mix should be you. Okay. So the very first thing when I uh, get told the story of walking into my buddy's church in San Diego, having to really quickly create a mix. What I did is I took everything out 
I started with me. I got a good volume. Now, someone uh, mentioned earlier over here in the comments, uh, avoiding volume creep, right? Things going up. We're going to talk about a solution for that in a second. But one thing that initially is just really important is making sure if you have it in your pack that your master volume is loud enough. If you have a, a, a personal monitor mix, make sure your volume is loud enough to start with. Get your mix, uh, your your part, you loud enough. And then we're going to add some things to that, right? So uh, first, we have us, right? So we are at the top of the pyramid. We're selfish people. We're selfish beings. Therefore, we should be the loudest thing in our mix. Now, next thing we need is some sort of pitch reference, right? Now, depending on your band, depending on the makeup of your band, uh, you might have a piano player. You might have a keyboard player. You might just have a guitar player, right? It might be a three-piece, bass, drums, and guitar. You need something that's going to allow you to have a pitch reference. If you're a singer, this is incredibly, incredibly important. This is why some singers struggle when they go to in-ears uh, and they're very pitchy. It's because they don't have enough pitch reference in their ear. So uh, singers, especially make sure you have some sort of instrument to balance to. Now, if you're just an instrumentalist, if you're just a guitar player, Again, you might think, ah, that's not really that important for me. I've got my tuner on my pedal board. I look down at any point I tune. I tune between every song. I know I'm good. Yes, but this is also about blending, right? And part of being in a band um, is, is moving from being just a musician or being just a great guitar player to be a good musician. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, that's a personal goal of mine is to not be a great guitar player, but to be a great musician. So part of being a great musician uh, is making sure that you can hear other people as well too. Um, so you, and then some sort of pitch reference, if at all possible, make it uh, a piano, make it something that's not going to go out of tune Do not pick an acoustic guitar, right? Uh, that could be very bad if you pick an acoustic guitar, cause they are never in tune as a guy who plays acoustic. They're never in tune, but we need us right first. We need pitch. The next most important thing is we need uh, something that's going to give us timing reference. Okay. So uh, if we um, are playing to click, then obviously this is click. Now my mix, the way my mix works is it's kind of a, a pyramid that's slightly adjusted. So yes, it's me. The second loudest thing or almost as loud as me is the click. That's just the way I like playing. I'm a better guitar player when I hear click really loud. I can lock in better um, to the drummer when I hear click really loud, right? That's just my personal preference. But you need you, you need pitch, you need timing. Now, if you're not playing with click, again, this webinar is not about getting you to play to click, getting you to play to tracks. Um, if you need, uh, if you aren't playing with click, your timing reference is your drummer, right? So you need to make sure you can hear kick, hat, snare at, at the bare minimum loud enough to give you a timing reference, right? So we have us at the top there. We're selfish beings. We have to have us loud enough. Um, and it's not purely just selfish, right? It really is true. As a guitar player playing on stage, if I can't hear myself, I might think, oh, I am so humble because I have myself so low in the mix. I'm such a humble person. But no, that's terrible, right? That's a terrible, terrible idea. You need to make sure you can hear yourself so that you are uh, creating the best possible performance, right? And you're blending in with everyone else. So when we talk about that mix pyramid, <coughs> Excuse me. We're talking about the mix pyramid. We have us at the top. We have a pitch reference. We have a timing reference. Uh, and then I would say, and this could be kind of different based on what your setup is. I would call the next thing complementary parts. Now, if you are a vocalist, uh, this would be other vocalists, right? Now, note that I said you as a vocalist, pitch, timing, and then the other vocalist, right? Um, if, you know, I don't care how well you can blend if you're not in key and you're not on time, right? So you, you need to make sure you have enough pitch reference, uh, preferably not an acoustic guitar. You have enough timing reference. If it's click, let it be click. If it's drums, let it be drums. Could be both if possible. And then complementary parts. So singers, it's other singers. Electric guitar players, it's the other electric guitar player, right? Again, I don't think it's this for guitar players. I think it's you and then guitar player, right? Because you could blend and you guys could be doing the coolest 80s harmony parts ever. But if you're out of tune and you're out of time, nobody cares, right? It all falls apart at that point. So uh, drummers, right? It's you. It's uh, a pitch reference. You know, that's probably not that important for you as a drummer. So maybe we extend timing out to be all of that. You still need some sort of pitch reference. Uh, click, right, for you as a drummer. And the complementary parts, most important thing, bass. 
and then we kind of tuck everything else behind that. So once we get us, we get pitch, we get timing, we get our complementary parts. The next thing we are going to talk about, the next thing we have to have is everything else, right? Now, again, let's go back to the point we made earlier. It's in your uh, monitors. It's not in your listening. I have a buddy that he always talks about uh, creating in-ear mixes. And whenever he does a session about in-ears, he talks about how it should sound like a CD. And I think that's yeah, easy for you to say because you literally tour with someone who's paid lots of money to mix your in-ears every time you step on stage. That makes it pretty easy to have an in-ear mix that sounds like a record. But I don't think your in-ear mix should sound like a record. I think your in-ear mix should sound like you, pitch, timing, people you need to blend with, and everything else, right? And again, we're just talking about volume here. We have not even started. Someone mentioned a question about panning. We haven't even started talking about panning. We haven't talked about a stereo system. If you're using a mono system, a couple of people emailed in and said, um, hey, you know, I know we need to be on a stereo system. We just don't have budget. We haven't done it. We're mono. Apply this. If you apply these mix essentials, it's going to get you fairly far, right? So starting there with just the mix essentials. Again, just to recap here, it's you. It's pitch, it's timing, complementary parts, and then everything else. And again, complementary parts depends on what you're playing. Drums, it's bass, vocals, it's other vocals, guitar, it's the rhythm guitar, lead guitar. But it's all about creating that blend and being a, uh, being a musician and not being just a guitar player. Now... Let's go back to uh, someone earlier mentioned a question about uh, how do you avoid volume creep, continually raising volume to hear the parts you need more of until you run out of slider, until you run out of fader, right? You literally have no other way to get more, right? You get your inner mix built, you do your mix essentials, and then suddenly it's like, oh, I need more of me. And the sound engineer or you, you're looking at your personal monitor mix. There's just no more to go. What do we do then? I want you to practice this principle of subtractive mixing, right? Sounds very complex. Sounds very much like something that you have to go read an article in a mix magazine or watch a mix with the master's session to understand, watch Pensado's place to understand. But it's really simple. There's two ways to get more of something. Turn it up or turn everything else down, right? Sounds like a deep philosophical statement. Two ways to get more of something. Turn it up or turn everything else down, right? So the way I want you to think of when you need more, I want you to start thinking less of stuff. So for instance, um, I'm currently running front of house at uh, my church here in Austin. And on Sunday, uh, one of the musicians was struggling being able to hear his vocal. And he said, it just it, it just sounds like everything's kind of washy. It's kind of muffled. It's muddy. I can't really hear it that well. I need more of my vocal. Well, his vocal fader was up pretty high on the board. Now, I should have already stepped in. Uh, I should have taken this webinar before I mixed Sunday and mixed years for him. But I should have stepped in and said, hey, your fader's going pretty high on vocals. What's your pack volume at? So what I had him do is I brought everything else down. I left his vocal where it is. Then again, I had him set his pack volume, his in-ear pack volume, um, loud enough so that that felt like a good level. Now that's probably going to change from hearing nothing to hearing the rest of the band. But again, we talked about it before we got in, even before the mix is interesting, you got to get you loud enough, right? So get your level loud enough, get your in-ear pack loud enough. I always start with like 75% volume, right? That way I've got a little bit more headroom. Now, depending on your solution, you might do 50, you might do 60, um, but you've got to give yourself a little headroom. You get to the situation where you need more of you. Uh, we're not going to turn up. Maybe you turn up just a little bit to get more of you, but the best case scenario is to start bringing everything else down, right? Um, I triggered Siri by saying that. Fun. Best case scenario is in order to get more of you, we want to start bringing everything else down. So that's the concept of subtractive mixing, okay? Um, the next thing I want you to practice, this again requires no gear. All three of these things, mix essentials, uh, you know, you, pitch reference, timing, complementary parts, everything else, requires no gear, no extra gear to make this happen. Two, subtractive mixing, no extra gear. It's a philosophy. It's a way to mix, a way to change things requires no extra year. Third thing, 
Uh, some of you may not like this. I want you to build a relationship with your mix engineer. Now, if uh, your uh, front of house engineer, if she is mixing your ears, it's very important to build a relationship with her uh, so that you build that trust. Now, even if all she's doing is just literally mixing your band and not mixing ears, it's incredibly, still incredibly important to build that relationship. Why? Because the best way to create a great sound at front of house is to make sure the band has a great in-ear mix, right? I'll say that again. Best way to create a great sound at front of house is to make sure the band has a great in-ear mix. Now, again, the situation I'm at running front of house, um, I'm mixing ears and I'm running front of house. It's a lot to juggle. I'm also dealing with other uh, tech situations, making sure everything's running. But I continually have to remind myself <coughs> the most important of those three is a great in-ear mix for the people on stage. And it's easy for me as a musician to have empathy because I've been on stage and had the bad in-ear mix and tried to make it through a performance with a bad in-ear mix. But the best way to have a great performance, a great sound in front of house is to have a great front of uh, a great in-ear mix. Now, what do I mean about this relationship with the mix engineer? One, you've got to build trust. You've got to build the ability for the front of house person to go, hey, um, you're a little pitchy. Do you, you need a little more pitch reference in your ears and then you to not like just completely lose it on them and freak out and fire them or you quit your band because they told you you're slightly pitchy. That can only come with trust, right? Now, you might be in a situation, uh, someone earlier was saying uh, they're in a cover band. They're likely in a situation when they're going to a different venue with a, a different front of house engineer. So it makes it a little more difficult. Uh, this particularly applies to my church folks that are watching this that have the same person or maybe different people mixing every week, you've got to build that relationship. One, you got to get trust going, right? Um, the other thing you need to figure out beforehand, and this is going to be part of building relationships, how are you going to communicate? If your front of house engineer is mixing your ears, how do you say, I need more of something, I need less of something, I'm good, right? Um, are you going to verbally say, I need four more, I need four less? Uh, the church I'm at, that's what they currently do. It doesn't help me a whole lot. Uh, but that's the way they communicate. We have a, a, a language we communicate in. My personal preference is to do this, right? When the drummer hits his kick, everyone does this till they need more. And then when the, the sound engineer slowly moves the fader, and then once you're good, you do this, I'm good, right? Um, I don't have people do this, thumbs up, right? Because this looks a lot like this, depending on what distance you're at. So I say up, down, and then we're good. Again, that really only applies if your front of house engineer is mixing your ears for you. If you're in that situation, I would encourage you to do one instrument at a time, right? Do kick, hat, snare, good. Do the full kit. Everyone good with drums, great. Now go to bass. Don't just have the band suddenly start playing. A line check is important as well, too, if you're in a new situation um, every night in a new place. Um, the other thing is get a talkback mic for your front of house engineer. This is key if you are mixing ears at front of house for your front of house engineer to communicate with the band. Have that talkback mic so... You, the band can you know say kick up or down or whatever and then the front of house engineer can say hey is everybody good do we have any ear changes as opposed to yelling across the room right when things get tense there's nothing worse than to uh, to yell across the room all right again so that's three things we talked about that require no money require no additions to your setup right um, one practice those mix essentials again you pitch timing, complimentary stuff, everything else. Now, one other note, let me um, let me kind of touch on this briefly uh, before we move on here. So let me bring this slide back up. Now, when I look at this in the context of, let's say you're in a band where there's a consistent leader, okay? You're in the band where one person always sings lead vocals. Uh, someone earlier was mentioning they're not in that situation. Yeah, uh, Jared was mentioning um, uh, he's in a situation where uh, the singer sings background and then they sing lead and they're louder when they sing lead than when they sing background. Um, so you've got to make sure within this that you do have enough of whoever the leader is, whoever the main person is so that you can hear them, uh, but it can't be too loud. So sometimes it, it might be, uh, Jared, specifically speaking to your situation, you're going to probably need to set it to where um, it's probably pretty good for background and maybe just a little too low when they're leading. If they do a lot of like, let's go off click, or let's change the arrangement, then maybe have them a little loud, and then you just kind of have to adjust with everything else. But I would still make that you pitch timing and then that leader person there, right? Um, that's going to be important. And sometimes you might have a mix where you can't hear the rest of the drums. You have no toms. You have kick, hat, snare, and click, right? Or you might even just have kick, snare, 
and click. You, sometimes you have to sacrifice again. Subtractive mixing is taken away to get more. Um, but again, just a note there um, is make sure that um, you apply the mix essentials. Make sure you can hear enough of your leader. Again, second thing, subtractive mixing. Two ways to get more, turn it up or turn everything else down. I want you to start practicing turning everything else down. And third, final thing you can apply without spending any money. Uh, this is very anti-NAM. It's anti-gear, but it's to build a relationship with your mix engineer. That's super important so they can give you feedback. Because again, like we said, the best way to get the best front of house mix is to create a killer in your mix for the band. Now, let's talk about ways to improve your setup. Now, this is going to require potentially some money. But the very first scenario we're going to talk about may not require money, but it's going to require reconfiguring your setup. Um, and uh, some people have already asked a few questions that kind of tie into this. So let me address some of those and then we'll, we'll come back here. So uh, Rod said, uh, what are your thoughts on panning? I found it very helpful to differ differentiate key vocals and instruments if I have them panned away from each other. Just curious what your th thoughts are. Thanks. Uh, someone else said, pitch in both ears or one. I was told to put lead guitar in one ear and rhythm in another. Yeah, so uh, what, what are they talking about when they're talking about this? They're talking about panning. They're talking about this idea of more than volume, right? So what is panning? What is more than volume? Um, it's the idea of going from mono to stereo. And that's what I want to talk about for a second. <coughs> I want to explain why it's beneficial. And then again, this may not require any money. It may just be taking your current system, your current setup. Maybe you have a few extra aux mix available, aux mixes available, and you want to transition those to stereo as opposed to mono. Why is stereo important? So let's put up this diagram here. Again, talking about more than volume. So each one of these little colored lines that I'm going to put up are going to represent different instruments or vocalists in our mix. And again, our volume is going top to bottom there. We see that sign over there to the left. So our volume is going top to bottom. Now, I've got myself in there, right? We talked about uh, obviously getting that going. And then I've got maybe my next instrument, which we could say is pitch or uh, timing reference. I would probably make them you know, the same level, obviously. And then we've got another instrument. So then uh, we can add that guy in. <coughs> again, if we're just talking mono, then all we have, the only control we have over these is just up and down, right? We have three instruments. The only way we can kind of mix between these three instruments is just levels. This one, this volume, this one, this volume, this one, that volume. Okay, let's add in another instrument, right? It's starting to get pretty clouded here. It's starting to get pretty muddy. Uh, a lot of stuff going on. And then we add a final instrument in. Again, all we're doing in this scenario is just balancing things with volume. We have this kind of one dimensional space. <coughs> It's just more or less than something. Uh, when you have a setup like this, when you have a mono setup, this is where it's incredibly, incredibly important to practice subtractive mixing, right? That idea of a way to get more of something is to turn everything else down. Now, what happens though, if we suddenly go from a mono mix to a stereo mix? So watch these same exact instruments. Let's leave them at the same volumes that we have, but now watch what we can do. We can take and we can spread these out, right? And when we start to spread these out, that's this concept of panning, okay? That's this concept of now we go from one mono signal. And, you know, if you're wearing two in-ears, you, you think, oh, I'm in stereo because I have two in-ears, right? I have left and right. Well, no, if you're in a mono system, you have dual mono, right? So you just have um, the same level going to both of your ears, right? Now, as soon as I go to a stereo uh, setup, I now, again, have the ability to adjust volume up and down. And I have the ability to pan things and move things left and right. So now to answer some of the questions from before, Rod mentioned, uh, found it helpful to differentiate, 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 that's a difficult one to say, differentiate key vocals and instruments. Um, someone else said pitch in both ears or uh, one. Again, I was told to put lead guitar in one ear, rhythm in another. So I want to talk about a couple different concepts here for panning. How should you pan things um, in order to make this really beneficial, right? Um, there's no standards on this. There's no right or wrong way to do this. I'll share a couple of my thoughts on it. Let me know in the comments if you are watching this live. If um, you're not watching it live, just let me know after the fact. Um, let me know, though, how you pan stuff, right? Um, do you separate lead and rhythm? Uh, do you have lead vocals here, background vocals there? Let me know kind of how you pan. <coughs> So here's a couple of my thoughts on painting. One, again, if we think about you as, uh, as the most important thing, again, let's go back to our diagram here. 
I'm the most important thing, so I'm the loudest thing in my mix. Look where I also am in the mix. I am in the center there. So I'm in the center of the mix, and then I pan stuff left and right. Now, again, for me, um, I just go and I keep my click dead center too. I don't pan click. Now, I know some people, uh, my buddy Christian, I think, pans his click hard left, and he says it's so, um, you know, he could take an ear out, right, if he, if he needs to as he's singing, which he shouldn't. But two, it also just is a reminder of like click is always there. If I lose it for some reason, it's gone. Uh, I work with a few people now at the church I'm at now that like painting the click. I just don't like that. I want click dead center. Uh, I want me dead center as well too. And again, those are almost the same volume just for me. Now, let's talk about what Rod mentioned. What about, I have two guitars. I have lead guitar, I have rhythm guitar. Uh, do you pan them separately? Yes, I would say probably don't leave both guitars here because then we just have volume. Let's kind of separate those out. Now we have to think about everything in our mix. If you have um, um, keys, you have to think about where do I place the keys according to the guitars? Where do I place vocalists according to everything else? Here's a couple points. Um, and again, let me, David brought up a good point that I'm gonna mention here in a second. Um, here's my kind of suggestion. If you have keys that are, are in stereo, or you have instruments that are in stereo, then try to make those maybe a little wider. So I take my keys and I pan the left, hard left typically, and the other one hard right. If I have two electrics, then I'm probably going to place the electrics a little like this or maybe a little wider. And then as far as vocalists, this is where I get into what Dave said. So Dave has a great idea here. Uh, usually pain to mimic where the instruments are located. That seemed logical, but I have no idea if that's valid. Again, I don't think it's if it's valid or not. I think if it works for you, then I think it's great. So here's what I would say. Again, keep me center, keep click center. And then I would do what David said there, which is, Okay, from that point on, start to move people where they are on stage. So if I have a vocalist over here, I'm probably going to put her over here in my ears. If I have a vocalist over here, I'm probably going to put him over here. The other thing I do, um, I typically keep bass in the center as well, too. Um, and just because, again, I've heard this, I'm not a mix engineer, so someone's probably going to refute it. But uh, I've heard if you pan bass, then it starts to lose volume and you have to increase volume to adjust it. So for me, it's me, click, bass, you know, right in the center. Drums, I, I try to pan drums based on kind of where they are in the mix. Uh, Valley View Chapel is a worship leader. I pan everyone relative where they are on the platform with me, my guitar, and click, top, dead center. Yeah, I, again, I think that's probably the best thing, right? Think of stereo instruments, try to make them stereo. Think of complementary things, try to separate them in the stereo field. But then for everything else, just place it where they are on stage. Now, if you're like, um, uh, you're a rock band that's like walking all over the stage, now that might not be the most beneficial thing because everyone's going to end up different. But um, here's the thing, you know, again, Dave said, I'm not sure if that's valid or not. If you step on stage, you can hear yourself, you hear pitch, you hear timing, you feel comfortable uh, you feel like you can perform well and you end up creating a great performance again, no matter what type of music, no matter the venue, then it's valid, right? It's a little bit of relative truth when it comes to if you want to pan your click, if it makes you comfortable and you can, you can uh, deal with it and stay on the click. Great. If you can't stay in time, I don't care how much you want to pan the click. Uh, if it's not working for you, I'm going to tell you, okay, bring it back in center and let's see if you can stay in time there. But again, just speaking from personal preference, thank you guys for sharing. If anyone else is watching live and wants to share, uh, plus uh, plug that in. And then again, if you're watching after the fact, you can plug that in comments there. Um, Josh has a good question. What's your smallest reasonable increment for panning 6040 versus 6139? Obviously unreasonable. I run stereo mixes, but I've typically kept everything balanced at 50 50. Um, uh, Matthew, do some kinds of sounds need to be panned out further or uh, in further for clarity? Let me answer Matthew real quick. Matthew, for me, um, it's wherever it sounds best, right? Again, if it's a stereo instrument, I typically make it wide. Uh, if stereo guitar, I typically make it wide. Although, <clears throat> don't tell the guitar player. Sometimes I just keep one side. I don't care that you want to sound like an awesome guitar player. Just give me one side of your guitar. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think wherever you get the clarity, and the clarity is you have all these instruments, we have volume, we got to move them where they fit, right? Uh, Josh, um, I don't know that I know the answer to that question. I run stereo mix, but typically kept everything balanced at 50 50. Um, I guess, uh, increment for painting. Yeah. Maybe Josh, if you could rephrase that, I, I know that may be way too technical for me, uh, as a sound engineer, uh, question, but if you could rephrase it, I'll see if I get it. If not, I'm sorry. I'm stupid. You're not stupid. I am. Um, uh, okay. So painting. Uh, if you guys have any other questions about painting, throw those in the comments. But again, the goal here is it's about more than volume. If you're looking for suggestions, just go back and rewatch. Great comments from people 
uh, on how they mix. But again, it goes down to where do you get the most clarity? You're not going to get clarity by keeping everything in the center because that's a mono mix. You're, you could, but you have to, again, work the volume really well. Um, and here's another secret I want to tell you. Uh, let's make sure nobody's listening in. You don't have to hear everyone on stage, right? If you have an auxiliary percussionist that's doing the rain stick uh, or they're playing tambourine, you don't have to have them in your mix. Now, if you're a drummer and you want to sync up with the percussionist, maybe you should. Uh, if you have a fourth background vocalist that they're not leading anything, maybe just don't put them in the mix. Again, unless you're the MD or you're the vocal director and you are in charge of, of making sure their parts are right, you do need to hear them. Um, but uh, if you are in the situation where you have some people that are just kind of there to, to add some extra harmonies, which are completely valid. Now, front of house, I'm going to try to get that level as, as great as I can, as tight as I can with those vocalists. But for me on stage as a guitar player, I don't need to hear the fourth part um, to, to, to perform better for me. So, um, let's see what else we got. Oh, one other point I want to make before we move on. And again, we're talking about some stuff that's going to require a little bit of, uh, of gear or shifting things around, maybe a little bit of money. Um, one thing I want to mention, <coughs> excuse me, getting over a bit of a cold sinus infection. Just the season for that. Uh, a, a few of you mentioned, um, and this was specifically from people that uh, I am assuming are working in churches and they're in either a worship leader role or MD role, or they're a worship leader who also is an MD and people basically said, okay, I need to in rehearsal, uh, be able to hear everyone. Um, or they talked about while they're in the church service or they're in the performance, they need to be able to hear all the parts to make sure everyone's playing everything just right. Here's a bit of word of encouragement. Hopefully it's encouragement. It might be a bit of discouragement to you. But I think one thing you could do, if you have a mixer that you can save mixes, um, you could save some mixes that are like, okay, just vocal mix. And at a portion of the rehearsal, you just solo out the vocals, right? Now, I encourage you, don't do that at soundcheck. I'm a big proponent of not having rehearsal at soundcheck or not having soundcheck at rehearsal, splitting those off. That's a whole nother webinar for another day. But I would say, okay, create your mix to just hear vocals, create your mix to just focus on guitars, right? Um, and then when you step on stage, if you really need to, and you go to actually perform or uh, you're going to actually rehearse and you're like running the set, then go to your normal mix and just kind of get in the moment. Uh, and I think at that point, you need to worry less about what people are doing. So here's kind of the encouragement discouragement though, is yes, there needs to be some moment where you can monitor, you can check in, you can double check that Yes, that guitar player is playing the right part. That keyboardist is playing the right part. But you've got to get to a point where your people know the parts. So you've equipped them well. And I, I don't care the, the venue, the environment, the type of music. Your band knows the parts. They're playing well. Um, and then you, though, as a leader, as the musician, worship leader, MD, whatever it is, you have to trust them. And if you're in a situation, it goes back to the same thing we talked about as a sound engineer. If you're in a situation where someone's continually missing their parts, then you probably need to move them on or you need to better equip them. Put it on you at first and assume you need to equip them better. But eventually you might need to move them on. If someone's consistently missing stuff, it just may not be for them. But if you've equipped them well, if you've taken a little bit of time in rehearsal and said, okay, let's make sure the vocal parts are right, then when you step on stage to actually perform, you need to trust that they are right. Now, for some of us, that's really difficult so here's the thing. Go back to number two, right? I think it was number two in what we said. Number three, build a relationship with your mix engineer. That's a moment for you to talk with the front of house engineer afterwards and say, hey, how did the vocalist sound? And she could say, well, this person is a little pitchy here, that person there. And then just over time, you can build and correct that. So hopefully not. that's not a discouragement to everyone. Uh, let's see. It looks like we got a couple other questions here. John said, uh, I'm going to try panning wider next time out. I've always tried to pan instruments with similar frequency profiles, occupying the same sonic space apart. Seems to add to the clarity. Yeah, John, I think that's a good idea because we, yeah, we have volume. We even really talked about frequency. Again, some people ask, well, how do I EQ this? What compressor do I add here? We're not going to get into a whole lot of that, but the basic idea is yes, if I have this thing that's in this mid frequency and this thing in this mid frequency, yes, I can adjust by volume, right? And adjust the volume there in the same frequency. But if I start to pan, it's going to give me a little bit more separation, which could be good, which is great. Um, Josh, let's see. Uh, he's going to, uh, he's tried to explain a little bit cause I'm dumb. So let's see as a musician, what's the smallest reasonable increment to request from the monitor tech for painting? Oh yeah. Yeah. Josh. Great question. Great question. Thanks for, for clarifying. Um, I think, there's nothing that's unreasonable, right? So again, for um, 
for, and I typically talk about like a clock, right? Is the way I think about it. So uh, for key stuff, for stuff that's, that's stereo, I typically go hard left, hard right. <coughs> uh, for, you know, uh, we talked about based on stage. If I'm here and there's a vocalist over here, I might say, okay, uh, give me that vocalist at, uh, at maybe 10 o'clock, nine o'clock, right? So I think more kind of in those terms. But again, I don't think anything is unreasonable. Now, if you're starting to say, uh, okay, here's keys. And instead of keys, like, you know, hard left, hard right, and you're doing keys hard left and like this, um, that might be a little weird to me because you have keys occupying all this space as opposed to kind of separating them out there. But again, I'd say if it adds to clarity, um, go for it. Whatever you've got to get to get that clarifying mix, I think do that. So, um, so much we could talk about painting. All right, let me move on. Let's see how we're doing for the sake of time. Great. We'll wrap up in about 15, 20 more minutes. Again, keep throwing questions and you guys have great questions. I love doing these webinars because of the questions you guys uh, have. Uh, second thing, add in effects for vocalists. So um, we're going to talk about um, uh, how live mix uh, here in a second has built in verb that you can use, which is really great, which can help say this. Um, but add in effects for vocalists. So for vocalists, add in some reverb that they can hear. Um, so that it doesn't just sound very dry, right? That's going to help get away from this. It's going to feel like they're going to be in uh, in a space, right? Which is going to be good. So you could add some effects. Now, when we talk about effects for vocals, <clears throat> again, I'm just going to give some um, uh, some quick suggestions here. So <clears throat> I would say reverb. Some people like hearing delays, but it can quickly sound like a you know a, a EDM show or a very produced pop record. And if your engineer is not very musical, I, I would not put vocal delay in my ears, but I would put vocal reverb. Um, probably with vocalists have some sort of compression going to the ears. Now this can be really, really tricky because uh, you've got to get it right. So maybe start without it. But if you have some time to really tweak and work on a mix, try to get compression set so that, uh, and someone earlier was talking about when the singer sings lead uh, versus background, this could help with some of that compression stuff. So if you don't know what compression is, basically you put a compressor on something and it takes our highs and it brings our highs down a little bit, takes our lows and it brings our lows up a little bit. Now a really strong compressor is going to keep everything even. Uh, you can kind of loosen your compressor up to where we, we want to kind of keep it in this range, right? But we'll let occasionally let it fall down. We'll occasionally let it go above that. But a compressor is going to try to keep things pretty even. Now, again, here's what I encourage you. Sound engineers are notorious for overthinking, for overdoing it. Before you even get to a compressor in your ears, uh, I would encourage you, go to the mix essentials. Get that right. Go to panning. Get that right. Maybe next move to some EQ, and we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but then you could go to some of the dynamic stuff, compression. I would not add any gate whatsoever uh, to your vocals, and especially not in the ears. I've um, played with a, a mix engineer that would gate my electric, and it was an awful experience, especially as I'm doing swells, because it would go in and out. So we continue to ask him, take the gate off. And he did, which is great. Goes back to building the relationship, which is good. Um, Dave said, my biggest issue with my new in-ears is hearing myself sing. I know it's going to be different. Do you have any ideas um, where what I hear in my ears is closer to what I used to hear in the stage wedges? It's a really good question. Really good point, Dave. So um, one thing to keep in mind when we're talking about what, what you hear in wedges versus what you hear in in-ears. When we're talking about wedges... And what we hear in wedges, yes, we do hear what's coming out of the wedges. One, it's it's giving us that space between what we hear and when we hear it in our ears. But then we're also hearing everything else around us. So when we go to in-ears, suddenly we lose all that and we go to just our vocals, right? So that kind of gives people that feeling of like isolation, right? So one of the things that helps as a vocalist is reverb. Second thing um, uh, that helps as a vocalist is this next thing we're going to talk about is to add in audience mics. So um, this really helps to, again, make it feel, you get some of that space back, Dave. So you get some of the space that when you go from wedges to ears that you lose, you start to hear the room more. Uh, you start to connect with the room. If you end a song and you think, man, we did really well and everyone claps, but you hear no clapping, that's going to feel awkward as a performance. Again, going back to it, um, as you step on stage, um, uh, the best way to create the best performance uh, and best sound in front of house is a, is a great in-ear mix. If it feels awkward, you can't connect with the room, you're not going to be creating a great performance because you're going to feel kind of just disconnected, right? Going to feel a little weird. So I think, um, one, adding in some reverb, some effects for your, your, your vocals helps. Two, I think adding audience mics in 
uh, can really help as well too. So I've got a suggestion here for, uh, let's pull this guy up one second. There we go. For a mic you could use, this is a Shure SM81. Uh, this is what we have at my church, just on either side um, of this of the stage, basically. We have these both set up on the side of the stage, pointed out at the audience, and they're separated on either side. Um, and then <coughs> I typically pan those in everyone's ears, right? So I hard pan those in everyone's ears. So they kind of fill uh, in here a bit of the room. Again, you have to be really careful on these, especially when you add audience mics in uh, and you have reverb. You can't get it sounding like a cigarro sh uh, show unless you're cigarro. So maybe you do want that. Um, so you um, you put your audience mics up. That's going to help you, again, connect to the audience, hear them respond, help you feel a little more connected, a little more in the room. Uh, Dave, another thing to your point, if you can get those instruments panned based on where they are on the stage, Think that's going to help as well too uh, if you don't get this sm81 basically uh, a small diaphragm hypercardioid condenser is going to do the trick if you have no idea what those big words mean i don't know what they mean uh, go to sweetwater call sweetwater sales engineer tell them we'll send you they they might send me an extra box of candy they're, they're not going to send me any money but maybe they'll send me an extra box of candy but tell them we'll send you uh, and let them know you're looking for audience mics and they will send you in the right direction so um, again, one, go from a mono mix to a stereo mix. That's going to be huge. Two, add in effects for vocals, uh, reverb, uh, uh, some EQ probably. Uh, and we're going to talk about EQ in a second that will help. Um, uh, definitely add the, the reverb in there and then maybe some compression at the end. But be very careful and definitely 100% no gate. Next is add in audience mics. Again, um, we talked about the SM81 as a uh, potential solution for that. Um, here's the last thing, uh, again, as a kind of gear based thing that I want to suggest. And then we're going to talk about choosing a monitoring solution for you. So you might be in the market for trying to find something new. We'll talk through a few considerations there. Here's another thing you could do is have a separate channel for your in-ears. Um, uh, let's talk about vocals for a second. So let's imagine my vocal comes into my mixer. Most of us are probably using digital consoles. If you're not, this is a little harder. You're going to have to get a radial AB switch or splitter rather but basically what we're doing essentially is we're taking our vocal that's one channel and i want you to split it to two channels right and then on the one channel for front of house me as the front of house engineer i can add as much compression reverb delay that i want to <coughs> i can eq it for the room to get everything sounding great but then on that mic uh, that channel for the ears what I'm going to do is EQ that and I can start by maybe copying my EQ for you, but then I can go in and make some specific changes to your channel in the EQ, uh, the EQ of your channel of your vocal mic just for the in-ears that does not affect me. So I could get very drastic with cutting lows and cutting highs or cutting a lot of mid range or boosting some mid range uh, to try to get things to sound better. That would sound awful for me, but for the sake of your ears gives you some clarity, right? Um, yeah, again, you could do that with EQ. That's where you could do separate compression for that channel versus what you have in front of house, which could be cool. Um, I'm going to share a solution though here in a moment that's going to make that easier. So again, to recap, how to improve your current setup, and then we're going to talk about choosing a setup. One, take advantage uh, advantage of the stereo image, right? So pan, set your in ears up so that you can start panning things. A lot of great suggestions in the comments, um, as well as uh, just what we talked about of where to pan. Two, add in effects or vocalists. Three, add in audience mics. And then four, consider having a separate channel uh, just for ears for that instrument, right? So vocal gets split twice, EQ separately uh, for ears from front of house could be really beneficial. All right, let's see. Nick has a question here. Again, great questions. Uh, you guys keep them coming. Uh, Nick says it has some pretty decent gear. Six driver IMs, good drum set, play into an avion. And I can't seem to make my mix sound the way I'd like. Tips on EQ or any other ways to enhance the sound? It's a great question, Nick. So one, I think it's really important to make sure that you've isolated your ears from the sound you hear. So you need to start by going, am I not hearing? If you have good in-ears and are custom in-ears and you're probably isolated fairly well, if they're not, the seal may be wrong on your ears. I had a buddy, poor guy, had his in-ears stolen, got new in-ears made and they didn't seal right and he had to send them back to, to get them remade again um, and make uh, custom molds again. If they're not sealing well, just by putting them in and just playing, then consider maybe getting the molds redone if you can, depending on what your what, what company you're working with that you got your in-ears from. So I think start there. Then you set it your kit. Um, and again, 
don't overthink it. Don't start getting into EQ just yet. The most important thing to consider is volume, right? So volume of you. Now as a drummer, um, depending on, now this is where it's tricky, depending on how your AVM is set up. And I think the newer AVMs give you more channels, but I remember when we had literally 16 channels and that's it. Uh, and the drum mix would be like a stereo drum mix from front of house. And I basically, you know, everyone would have control over the drums, uh, basically up or down. And then at front of house, they would adjust panning. Here's what I would say. If you're in the situation where you don't have separate control over each of your uh, the parts of your drum set, uh, then w spend a lot of time working with your front of house engineer to get the painting right. Um, in the ears, I think the painting should be what is right for you, right? Uh, so if you just have, again, a stereo mix, just drums up and down, um, then make sure that panning is right just for you. If uh, you have a couple channels open, have them separate kick, you know, snare, and maybe overheads or something, and then uh, blend toms in with the overheads if possible. Um, I think the biggest thing though, let's say if you have separate control over everything, um, I think the biggest thing is you need to get to where as you play, you feel like you hear it at the level that 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 is right, okay? So perfect example, sit down behind the kit, play, a, 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 play your snare drum, do a, a roll on your snare, and if you feel like the dynamic of what you're playing is represented appropriately in your ears, right? You doing that uh, and doing a snare roll on the snare should not be as loud as when you're doing a, 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 a I just lost the term, rim shot. If you're doing a rim shot, it should be substantially louder than when you're doing a snare roll. So I think if you play and that dynamic feels right, then I think you're good. So I think dynamic is important. And that's going to come a lot with volume. So then when you go to toms, right, panning is very important. Make sure when you play a tom, it feels like the volume's right and the panning's right. Um, and then I think you just are going to have to spend some time by yourself just playing and adjusting and getting everything dialed in. Um, but you might end up feeling like you're going to have to sacrifice something or cut something. Now, I think you can get really far with volume and with uh, uh, panning before you ever have to touch EQ. But then when you go to EQ, there's certain things where you'll need to ask your front of house engineer, does the EQ that she does affect what you hear or is it separate? And if it's separate, have they done anything to it, right? Are they cutting out the boxiness of their snare? Uh, if not, have them maybe find 500 and cut some of that out. Now, if you, um, uh, if you have the ability to, again, just uh, adjust frequencies of individual instruments, that would be good to sit down with um, a front of house engineer, someone that's experienced. Uh, honestly, the best thing to do is go through uh, Mix You Now uh, by my friends Jeff uh, Lee and, uh, oh, I forget Andrew. I always forget Andrew's name. Uh, but uh, they started Mix You Now, great platform for learning, especially for frequencies, mixing drums. You could take that and apply that to your personal mix, right? To figure out what to cut so that the snare cuts through, add some compression where needed, um, get your tom levels just right. And it's going to take a little bit of work, right? It's going to take a little bit of work, but I think you can go a long way with volume and pan before you ever get to EQ. Um, all right, and someone said uh, they're looking for recommendations for a new system. Well, perfect. That is a perfect segue uh, to move us into the next section, which is deciding on a monitoring solution, okay? So when we talk about um, mixing in-ears, how do we decide on a monitoring solution? The very first question we need to ask ourselves is, um, Who's going to mix the in-ears? Are you going to mix your ears or is the front of house engineer going to mix your ears? Okay. I think there's benefits to both. Again, if your front of house engineer mixes ears and you trust them and they know what they're doing, then the big benefit to that is you're probably going to get a great in-ear mix. The downside to that is it can get a little chaotic at times. Uh, again, for me, this past Sunday uh, at the church I work at, um, it was a Sunday where I was just having a really difficult time getting a good mix. And it was not the band. It was a fantastic band fantastic players. I was just struggling with drums and then it kind of moved to guitar and then it moved to keys and it was just struggling with everybody, right? I finally, thankfully we have two services. So the first one's a dress rehearsal and the second one is the real deal. And I got it right by the second, uh, second service. Um, but the benefit to having front of house do it is if they know what they're doing, then you could get a really good mix, right? Now, again, that's where it becomes really important. Trust them work on those hand signals, work on the communication that's really big. So let's talk about for a second, if uh, the front of house is going to mix your in-ears, then what do we need to talk about? Best thing there is wireless in-ear packs. Um, I'm not gonna suggest anything. I've had a lot of success with Sennheiser wireless in-ear packs, but here's the one point of suggestion I would say. If you're gonna skimp on something, uh, do not skimp on wireless in-ear packs. Whenever 
the W word comes into play and we talk about wireless. Typically, the more money you spend, the better it is. My kind of goal, and this is from a few years ago, so maybe it's changed. This stuff constantly changes, but anything sub $1,000, I typically am not going to trust. It's just not going to have a good sound, not going to have good consistency. So if we're doing a wireless in your pack, again, best case scenario is call Sweetwater. <coughs> Talk to a Sweetwater sales engineer. Ask them, I'm looking for a great wireless in your pack. Starts to become really important if you're going to use multiple ones, making sure uh, everyone's on different frequencies, no one's going to interfere, but get a high quality wireless in your pack. Now, let's talk about the next solution. This is kind of the, the budget solution. If you're um, if you're on this webinar and you're watching, most of the people asking questions are asking pretty specific questions. So you're likely probably not on the budget solution because you've got a great system or you're working through something. But I'm gonna give you a couple options if you are on a budget system. The best thing here is to use a headphone amp. Oh, there we go. So here's uh, my suggestion, the Personas HP2 personal headphone amplifier. So there's different versions of this. They have a HP215. I'm not sure what the difference is off the top of my head. I'm sure someone here does, or a Sweetwater sales engineer would be more than happy to tell you. Oh, I think it's between TRS and XLR inputs. Uh, but basically what this does, <coughs> excuse me, again, you're gonna get two XLR inputs and then it's gonna turn around, it's gonna give you some volume and then you get a, a volume for your pack, right? You wanna make sure this button, I think is pressed in for stereo, or no, I guess out, I can't remember. But make sure it's set to stereo so that you're not uh, set to mono. Uh, but you want to uh, you want to make sure you're set to stereo if you have a stereo mix, and then you can adjust your volume. So basically what you do here when we're talking about this scenario, oh, again, wrong picture, sorry. Uh, the um, If we're talking budget scenario, you're gonna go out of whatever your typical monitor mix is, your aux mix, um, our aux output on your board is into this headphone amp and then you're going to have your front of house engineer uh, mix ears for you or um, if you happen to have a digital console and we'll talk about this in a moment so uh, you can use your phone uh, and you can go in and mix your probably your ears uh, digitally on your phone app uh, and then have this amplifier this power amp that's going to give you the volume that you need and give you that volume control so again this is by no means the the best solution uh, but again, it's something that's that's going to give you a great kind of budget entry level solution to get started, uh, which could work. And again, pair that with a uh, an iPhone or an iPad that can mix ears if you have a digital console. And you could have a lot of success. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time uh, talking, is on personal monitor mixers. I think these are a great solution uh, for a band, especially for me. I uh, sometimes wish that uh, my band uh, had personal monitor mixers because it would make my life a little easier from the perspective of not having to mix their ears. Just want to run through a couple solutions here um, uh, as we get towards the end of the webinar. So first, um, most brands that make digital consoles are starting to, if they haven't, they will release uh, their own kind of version of in-ear mixer. So Personas has their EarMix 16M AVB, so it connects via AVB, which is a audio over... IP or Ethernet protocol, just connect the Ethernet cable in, uh, and you typically kind of wire these together. But if you're using a Persona Studio Live console, probably a great solution to start looking there. If you're in the Behringer or Midas ecosystem, the uh, P16s, uh, Behringer PowerPlay P16s are a great solution. Again, you can connect those in a lot of different ways, but just typically over an Ethernet uh, cable there. Uh, Allen and Heath ME1, and they also have the, what's the other one? They have the ME 500 PM, uh, which is another option that you could use. If you're using an Allen and Heath console, this could be a great solution for you and what you're doing. Um, and most of these, uh, most of these little mixers, uh, oh, keep doing that, sorry. Most of these little mixers uh, have little intricacies and cool things that they let you do or dumb things that they don't let you do. So again, talk to Sweetwater. Um, if you get the opportunity to maybe demo some of these out and see what works best, uh, that might be a good solution too. I do want to talk about the live mix mixers though from Digital Audio Lab. So um, there's two different personal monitor mixing systems uh, or units you can get uh, from Digital Audio Labs uh, that are live mix uh, units. One is called the CS Solo. Uh, and this is just a single uh, mix, right, for this uh, uh, individual person. Um, this can connect to an analog console, a digital console. They have uh, Dante cards, and I think they might have some other cards as well, too, to integrate with, uh, with other consoles. So they have the CS Solo, which, again, is just one mix for one person. 
Um, oh, and then they also have the duo. So let's pull this guy up one second. I, and I'll show you one of the things I really like about the duo that I think makes it a great solution, especially um, for those of you, again, uh, we're talking about those of you in the church world. I think this could be a really good solution. What's cool with the duo, it's essentially, I mean, it's literally the same exact thing as the solo, but with an extra output. So what you get is basically two solos in one unit. Now look at the difference in price here. 424 <coughs> for an extra 100 bucks as opposed to an extra 400 bucks, you get another mixer. So now you can half that in two, right? And we're looking at about 262 bucks per mixer. And we go through and compare this to the price of everything else. Okay, we could get it cheaper than that. Uh, we get it cheaper than that. Get it cheaper than that, right? So I'm a big fan of the CS Duo um, if you have. And again, the, they are separate independent mixes. It's it's two mixes in one box, but it does not mean they are sharing a mix. I want to really stress that point to you guys. Uh, let me know in the comments if you guys are using live mix. We had uh, a webinar at some point that was had nothing to do with um, with in ears, and someone was ranting and raving about the live mix. But if you guys are using live mix, uh, comment. Let me know, or let me know what you guys are currently using. Uh, a couple things I want to point out with the live mix stuff that I think is really cool. One, I think it's really simple. Uh, really intuitive control. So if you look at Live Mix Solo, which is duplicated on the Duo, <coughs> excuse me again, you have master volume. We have the ability to adjust the volume and pan of a specific instrument. And then we have me, right? I like the me knob. We're selfish beings. We're selfish creatures. I'm a big fan of the me knob, but it's simple, three simple controls. Now there's a touchscreen interface where I can dive in and I can do a lot of really cool stuff and go deep with it. But again, it's touchscreen, which obviously we're all used to using because of this guy. Um, and then it gives you the really, really simple control there. We talked about earlier, okay, can we add EQ dynamics to uh, to individual instruments? Um, we have the ability to add EQ and dynamics for each input. So you don't have to do that separate thing where we make the separate input I talked about if you're using live mix. You just do that at the mixer level. And again, I would love that as a front of house engineer right now. I'd love for my band to be able to add their own stuff um, and to be able to control that separately. Um, but here's the thing we talked about at the beginning. Why is one of the reasons this isn't good? Because typically we give people that don't know what they're doing, the ability to mix their own in-ears. I'm a big fan of two features on the live mix that I think are great. One is this idea of global setup. So I can go in and set up one mixer and push that to all the other mixers. I don't literally, I remember I'm not going to say the brand, but I remember setting up a certain mixer and we'd have to go around to every single individual mixer to get things set and then save. And if we happen to save wrong or recall wrong and then save, you'd start over. It was it was a disaster. With Live Mix, uh, you can set things up and do a lot of changes globally. The thing I really like is this idea of mirror mixing and remote mixing. So again, for me as a front of house engineer, I want this now because I want my team to be able to mix their on -ear, in ears. Um, and I want to be able to, when they need help and the guitar player says, hey, I'm struggling here in my mix, I want to be able to go into a live mix uh, that I have at front of house, a solo, select their mix, pull up their mix, and then mix their in-ears for them from another live mix controller. I think that is a really, really, really great feature. Um, another thing that's really cool about this, especially with the duo, um, and it applies to the solo and the duo, uh, but they have uh, a foot switch. And what's really cool about the foot switch is it gives you the ability, if you watch, uh, watch the video with Andy here on Sweetwater, and I think also this one, where they talk about the foot switch, it walks through every single feature of it. But what's cool about it is you can select an instrument, you can change volume and pan from the instrument. Uh, you can use the intercom feature, which again, that's something we didn't even talk about. How do you communicate as a band when you all have in-ears in? Uh, my The church I serve at, each band member has a mic. Um, sometimes they sing, sometimes they don't, but it's primarily for in rehearsal, they can all hear each other and talk. If you have live mix, <coughs> again, I'm selling myself on live mix for my church. But uh, if you have live mix, then each member can have a talkback mic built in and you can trigger it remotely using the foot switch controller, which is great. Again, check out the video that they have. It's crazy the stuff you can do there. Uh, so a lot of really, really cool options again with live mix. Um, one thing that's really cool. So again, full disclosure, Digital Audio Labs uh, uh, promoted this webinar um, uh, or sponsored this webinar so that you can attend live. So you can take all that with a grain of salt but it's an amazing, amazing mixer. One thing that's really cool that Andy mentioned to me beforehand is if anyone watching this, uh, someone mentioned earlier that their uh, worship leader is looking for a suggestion on a new system. 
if anyone is interested in uh, moving to a new system, moving to Live Mix specifically, um, Andy has a unit that just came off the road that was with a band that the band is trying to sell and that they're selling for a very, very affordable price. If you're interested in that and you're still watching, um, shoot me an email or just reply to any of the emails that uh, that I've been sending out. I'm going to send an email tomorrow reminding you again with the link. Just reply to that email and say, hey, that live mix system you mentioned, we're really interested in that. What I'll do is connect you with Andy, um, who will get you set up with that. So I think that could be a really good solution. All right. One final thing uh, or a couple final things before we wrap up. So we've talked about um, why we struggle with creating a great in mix, right? Uh, we think it's supposed to be instant. We have no training. We give people that have no training control over it. Guitar players, we've never listened to our guitar app. Vocalists, try doing this. This is difficult. Um, so many reasons why it's difficult. We can make it super easy by applying mix essentials, by using subtractive mixing, by building a relationship with our mix engineer. If we have a little money or we can reconfigure things, we can switch from a mono to stereo system. Again, you typically don't have to buy anything. You just have to reconfigure it. Uh, it might take a little bit more money, but if you can move from mono to stereo, again, we talked about the benefit of everything like this to now all this space. So we have up and down and we have left and right. So we talked about that. We talked about uh, going through and adding reverb to vocals could be great or get that live mix and add your reverb to your, your vocal. Um, if you don't have live mix, create a separate channel for um, your inputs for a vocal particularly and EQ that separately than everything else. Uh, that could be really beneficial and add in audience mics. Now, um, here's where, where I want to wrap up. I want to talk about, uh, now most of you probably watching this are the people that are in charge. You're the band leader. You're the music director. You're the worship leader. Um, you are the person in charge calling the shots. If that is you, I want to speak directly to you. If that's not you, still hang out. You know, it, it applies. But I want to speak directly to you. Um, how do you cast vision to your band? How do you cast vision to your team? How do you get them on board with the idea and concept of in-ears? I remember the um, last church that I worked at when I was in Florida, when we went from wedges to in-ears, I remember we had a, a, a one guy on the team that just struggled with it so much. He just did not like it. He did not get it. Uh, he just really struggled with it so much. And I think it's kind of because we like forced it on him as opposed to going through a few of these steps. So I'm going to take you through a few of these steps really quickly. Um, and then we'll wrap up and we'll have time for any other questions. Uh, if you guys have questions, again, pop those in the chat over on YouTube. So um, very first thing here, talking about uh, getting your team on board, equipping your band, equipping your team with this. How do we do it? One is cast vision, right? To me, it's all about what's in it for me. The theme of this is we're all selfish people. So when I go to do something or consider something, I need to know what's in it for me. Uh, if there's no benefit to me, I just don't care. I'm sorry. I'm busy. I got a lot going on. Um, what's in it for me? If you can't tell me what it, what's in it for me, I don't care. So I think you need to cast vision. I think you need to let people know why are we doing this? So uh, the question I have for you, if you're still hanging around watching, what's the biggest benefit for you of using in-ears that you found in with your band, with your team of using in-ears? I think as you go to cast vision to your band, you need to take them through those benefits. So let me know in the comments what to you is the biggest benefit. I want to run through a few of those. One, I think you get a personal mix, right? This is really important, again, when you're a vocalist, uh, singing with other vocalists. You can have you super loud and you can blend everyone else with you as opposed to having one wedge and trying to share that between multiple vocalists. Uh, as a guitar player, <coughs> again, as a guitar player, this is an incredible thing because I can stand on stage, I can move my guitar amp back to a closet, crank it up, have the best sounding guitar tone I've ever had with a tube amp um, and not have that on stage and not have to have the front of house engineer consistently yelling at me to turn it down. Drummer, someone earlier uh, that was a drummer, it was uh, Nick, we were talking about using in-ears as a drummer. For drummers, this is important because you get the mix that works for you. No one else has to share your mix, which is great. Perfect timing. Uh, Nick said, saving my uh, ears from all the excessive noise. Yes, it allows us to, these next two apply perfectly to that, allows us to lower stage volume, which is a far more efficient way to do that than this, which is putting your electronic uh, V drums behind a drum shield. I love this picture. I love sharing this. Allows us to get wedges off the stage, right? Um, by getting wedges off the stage, it allows us to lower stage volume. Those of you, uh, reduce the stage clutter, which is a big one. For those of you that are in a church environment, uh, and maybe it's a mobile environment where your pastor walks out on stage or pretty much every church is 
a setup where the worship team is up there and then you have to move out of the place and a pastor or someone welcoming has to walk on stage. You've got to get your junk out of the way, right? If you've got a giant wedge in the way uh, in front of your pastor, it's going to get in the way because you need it for you as a vocalist. And I've seen people literally like they go to leave and someone has to move the wedges and move it back. And then they forget when you come back out, it's a disaster. Reducing stage volume, um, getting rid of those wedges is huge. Reducing stage clutter is huge as well too. Doing that is also going to help with this next one, which is protect your hearing. So again, um, like Nick said, uh, you know, being able to be behind a kit and feel like you can still hear in 10 years, 20 years is very, very important. Uh, <clears throat> less said, uh, lower stage volume levels, mix clarity. Everyone hears each other much better and they perform better. Man, you guys are reading my notes, apparently. Um, great point, Les. Uh, Valley View said, I can hear everything I want to uh, in front of house without screaming wedges is a beautiful thing. Yes. Uh, Nick said he's seen this in real life, shield with electronic kit. Hopefully, Nick, that wasn't your setup. Uh, Andy said, biggest advantages of in-ears for me is stage volume, control over balance, cutting out things I don't need or want to hear. Uh, again, he says, no offense. I'm right there with you. If you don't need to hear that person, cut them out. No offense to them because they maybe don't need you and they can cut you out. And that's fine. And consistency. I think all those are great, Andy. Those are great ones. Uh, protecting your hearing. Again, Nick mentioned this. As drummers, this is really, really big. Uh, we set drummers up. We put them behind a drum shield. They've got a loud instrument and we put them behind a drum shield that just reflects that loudness back into their ears. Uh, I feel bad for drummers when I see them behind shields without ears. I see it less and less now, but being behind a shield, being a drummer, you've got to have in ears uh, to protect your hearing. That's really important. Uh, let's see. Les, I think, said this better. <coughs> Makes you a better musician. Again, for me, um, this is all about uh, a personal goal for me, which is moving from being a great guitar player uh, to being a great musician. That really is my goal, is I want to be a great musician, not a great guitar player. Um Having a, a mix yourself, yes, it can be a personal mix. You can choose what to hear and what not to hear, but it's really going to force you to hear everything at some point or another, and it's going to force you to not just hear yourself unless you um, mix your ears that way, and then it's not going to last for a very long time. It's not going to be great for you. Another great solution for me or another reason is it allows you to use a click track. Now, that's a whole other conversation for a whole other day because some people are going to push back on that some people are going to have resistance toward that. I'd encourage you to check out this article I did for Sweetwater. Again, this is going to be in the outline that I'm going to send you tomorrow. So make sure you've registered it from studiostage.com slash live so you can get that. Uh, why should you use a metronome when playing live? Um, and I just talked through some of the benefits of that. Uh, it was a pretty fun and controversial article on Facebook, which was great to see the comments there. Hopefully some of those people are in this webinar and they're going to rage when they see uh, me say you should uh, play with click. But anyway, um, it's going to give you a personal mix. It's going to lower stage volume, protect your hearing, make you a better musician. The point here is take those things and you need to message that to your band, to your team. You need to let them know this is why we're doing it. <clears throat> and this is the benefit to you. It's all about making sure people understand why it matters to them. Second thing is equip and train your band. Uh, have some dedicated time for learning the mixer. This is a mistake that, man, really, I think almost every church that I've worked at or, or served at has made, which is they go to a new system, whether it's going, um, the church I was at in Florida, we went from wedges to Aviom and Aviom to Allen and Heath ME1. Um, none of those transitions, I think, were really, really good because there wasn't a dedicated time uh, to here's the mixer, here's how to use it. Now, we did that in a sound check and rehearsal, but then it affected sound check and rehearsal, which then kind of affected the amount of time we had to be able to do that. So dedicate time to here's the mixer, send videos to your team. Live Mix Digital Audio Labs has some great videos that walk you through how to use their mixers. That can be really, really beneficial for your team. Again, I love that Live Mix has the mirror mix solution that allows your front of house engineer, the person who's trained, who knows what they're doing, to go in and adjust the mix and say, okay, this is a good mix, All right? We talked about briefly how mixing is a relative truth. If it works for you and you create, uh, uh, feel comfortable on stage and create a great performance, then it's good. But the truth is there is such a thing as a good mix and a bad mix. Your engineer can go on and say, this is what your mix probably should sound like. Let's start there and help them along if you're using live mix and doing the mirror mix. Um, help them learn how to build a mix. This is a great mix. Show them how to solve problems. Okay, here how it's muddy. The reason it's muddy is your volume on your pack's pretty low. So let's bring your pack up. Let's get your level really good and bring everything else. Let's do subtractive mixing. Here's my encouragement. And this is 
really big when you're in the moment and things go wrong. Don't just solve the problem, but show people why and how to solve the problem. This is a big one for me. Show them how to solve the problem so that next time when it comes up, they can solve it themselves or they understand when they go back to recall their mix, to redo their mix, they're not going to make the same mistake again. Or if they get it, they're going to be able to raise that up. So uh, third thing here, this is a big one, is schedule a deadline or a time. Hey guys, we're going to switch in years. We're going to do it in two months. Now, next Tuesday, we're going to do a training. I want everyone to be there. If you can't be there, email me now. Let me know. If you can't be there, I'm going to do a personalized training with you. After that training, if you need some more time, let me know and I will get with you to make sure you're fully equipped. I've got some videos I'm going to send out, spend a lot of time. In a month after we do our normal gig, after we do our normal service, after we do our normal performance, we're going to stay behind 30 minutes. That's what I'm asking for everybody. And we're going to try to do the same set we just did, but now with our monitors. Then we're going to come back in two weeks and do the same thing afterwards. Okay. And then in two weeks, uh, two months from the time I'm sending this email, we are going to switch fully to using monitors. Now, that set that we're doing is going to be all songs that we've known. Uh, that Sunday that we do this, it's all going to be songs that we know. It's not songs we need music stands for, not songs we need to think about so we can focus really on getting our mix well. <clears throat> I think that works really well for your team, for your band. If you give them the time, you set the expectation. And I think it's most important that you let them know we're doing this. I don't care if you don't like it, we're doing it. And you can choose to leave if you want. You can choose to quit the band. You can break up the band if you want. But we are going in this direction. Here's the reason why we're going in this direction. And I'm going to spend every ounce of effort and time I can between now and two months to get you prepared and ready. And if you're not willing to invest the time, the effort, you're more than welcome to leave because I can find someone that would invest that time. So set that schedule, set that deadline, and then do it. I think that's really important. So Cube, uh, Ben Stiller from Zoolander. I think that was Zoolander, right? Yeah, saying do it. So <clears throat> what now? What do we what do we leave with? What do we do? How do we wrap up this webinar? One, start practicing the mix essentials uh, for your next performance, right? Start practicing rebalancing your mix. Uh, take the the panning tips that we all shared. There are a lot of great suggestions in the comments from people of how to pan, right? Me in the center, click in the center, bass in the center, and then move everything else from there, uh, and then place people based on where they are on stage. A lot of great suggestions. Start with the mix essentials, though. And then you can move into some of the painting stuff as well too. Next is I want you to start mixing for monitoring and not listening. So for some of you, that may be going back to ground zero. You're starting from scratch. You click, pitch, complementary, everything else, right? Starting from scratch, I want you to start mixing for monitoring, not for listening. That's gonna be big. Final thing I want you to start doing and practicing is subtractive mixing. Two ways to get more of something, turn it up, or turn everything else down. I want us to do the separate thing. Uh, the second thing, final thing, which is to turn everything else down. So that is my call to action for you guys. That is my kind of a beckoning call is to practice those four things. Start practicing mix essentials, practice panning, uh, mix or monitoring, not listening, and then do subtractive mixing. So we're at the end here. I see people starting to, to sign off. We're at uh, an hour, 30 minutes. Um, and thankfully, I cut a whole beginning section because I knew this was going to go long because it's a fun topic and a lot of questions. Thank you guys so much for the great questions. If you have questions after this, just hit reply to any of the emails I've sent to you. Uh, would love to try to answer those. If I can't answer them, I'll try to send them to someone who can answer them. Um, so thank you guys so much for coming, for hanging. Again, tomorrow morning, you're going to get that replay link as long as you've registered it from studiostage.com slash live. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. If you want to, would love if you subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm going to send a link to everyone later. If you want to subscribe to the mailing list, uh, you're not on my mailing list. I will not e email you a single time after tomorrow with the replay link. But if you want to hear from me, I'll give you a way to do that. But thank you guys so much for being here. This was an absolute blast. Again, great, great questions. That's what made this is you guys had some great questions. So thanks for being here. Have a great night. And here's to great in-ear mixes for the future. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.